Or what do you? Britain's teenagers have got hundreds of questions about sex. Yet earlier in the year, the government bill that was going to make sex education compulsory in all schools was dropped. We've spoken to hundreds of teenagers across the country. 76% of them want more sex education. And the question on most of their minds is, am I normal? I just worry about like, the shape of my body. If everyone's saying, I've done this, I've done that, then everyone's going to sort of feel, oh, am I abnormal? Am I different? The Sex Education Roadshow is back. And every night this week, Monday to Thursday, we're visiting schools across the UK to give the teenagers of Great Britain sex education lessons like they have never seen before. On Monday, we proved that penises come in all different shapes and sizes and it's all perfectly normal. He's got quite a long penis, slightly bent. It's a little bit shorter. He's got a very, very different penis because he actually hasn't got a full skin here. Tuesday was ladies' night, where we proved that when it comes to boobs, there's no such thing as the perfect pair. People have this, you know, idea that everything's perfect and it's symmetrical. It's not at all. And tonight, we'll be teaching the teenagers of Rains Foundation School in London that the ageing process is very natural and very normal. These could be your grandparents, and I tell you what, they'll be you one day. And in case they don't believe us, we give them a chance to talk sex with mum and dad. How old was you when you had your first boyfriend? Um, 16. At what age do you think I should have my first boyfriend? 25. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we all deserve to have great sex, whether we're young or old, fat or thin, gay or straight. So this week, I'm tackling Britain's last sexual taboos and meeting groups of people who we just don't see as sexual beings. Tonight, I discover the ins and outs of sex when you're super size. Is there any kind of position that really suits your size? Doggy's pretty good as well. More cushion for the pushing, as they say. <laughs> and find out that for some, it can be an uphill struggle. Went to penetrate and couldn't. My penis then started to get buried underneath um, mounds of fat. Welcome to the Sex Education Show, where it's OK to be different. <laughs> Nobody but you and me. We've got it together, baby. Tonight, the Sex Education Roadshow hits the capital. Welcome to Rain School in East London, where we've been invited along to chat to the teenagers and answer everything they ever wanted to know about... What was it? Sex! And to get to grips with what the Rain students want to know about sex, we've given them our well-travelled question pod. What does the G in G-spot mean? Is it better for the woman to be on top or the man? What is the average penis size for a teenager? Do old people have sex? To help answer all their questions, I've brought my secret weapon, sexual health specialist Dr Rada Modgill. Today we're talking to the teenagers about ageing bodies, but it's not just all about grey pubes and saggy scrotums, because the good news is, folks, when it comes to sex, you're never too old. For teenagers, knowing they're normal is a top priority, and getting old is the most normal thing of all, but it's something the students at Reigns are completely in the dark about. Talked about puberty, but no one really talks to us about what happens when we get older and stuff. You know, the vagina probably looks like a prawn. Uh, I'm not sure what the menopause is. The menopause is... I haven't got a clue. It's really disgusting thinking of um, old people having sex, you know. <laughs> Ageing is perfectly normal, and even if our bodies change, droop and sag, there's still plenty of sex to be had, especially if you look after yourself when you're young. So, to open the students' eyes, we've brought along six models ranging in age from 60 to 80. They're going to bear all to show these pupils that getting old is natural. Hello, Reigns. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. 
Today, we're going to be teaching you everything there is to know about the ageing human body. Now, we wouldn't be able to understand how the body changes as we get older unless we had our live models. So please, welcome our models. Who's 61? <laughs> Terry, who's 66? Muriel, who's 68? We have got Mike. Hello, Mikey, 72. Now, get this we've also got Pam, who's 80. And then finally, we have got David. Hello, David, he's 78. These could be your grandparents, and I tell you what, they'll be you one day, and that's what our bodies look like as you get older. As you can see, these bodies range in terms of uh, sagginess and tone and wrinkles, really, but it's all perfectly normal. So, hands up, what do you think about these bodies on display? What have you got to say? They're a bit grey. They're a bit grey? Yeah. Did you know that your pubes go grey? No, not really. OK, well, you see, now you can have a conversation with your granddad and grandma about it, you see? <laughs> that guy on the end, like, I, I can't see anything there. Like. When you say you can't see anything, what can't you see? His, his penis. OK, David, we've got a worry from the young ones, apparently, about your nether regions. Rada, so just talk us through what happens to men. Boys, listen up. So the ageing process actually starts in your 30s and we're going to use our models here to go through the different ages and, and show you really what happens. We're going to have a look at Terry first. So um, we're going to look all the way down to the tummy area. So in the tummy area, you may notice that actually the definition of the muscle becomes a bit sort of less, less obvious, less defined. For men, those perfect rippling abdominal muscles can become less defined as they age. In fact, overall muscle strength can drop by 40% between the ages of 30 and 80. But regular exercise can keep muscle loss to a minimum. Men may also develop more pronounced breast tissue, commonly known as moobs, which is due to a drop in testosterone levels and a rise in the amount of the female hormone oestrogen. And now it's time to tackle the ageing tackle. With men, you don't get this sudden drop off in fertility like you do with women, but the sexual organs do change. And you can see here that sometimes the, the scrotum, which is the skin which holds the testes, actually becomes a bit laxer. You can see here that actually the penis size is actually relatively sort of normal. It hasn't actually started to reduce in size as yet. We're going to just go on now and have a look at Mike. So you can see here that actually the testicles, again, the pubic hair is grey, isn't it? Skin's become a little bit more wrinkly. It's losing its elasticity. We're going to have a look at David now. So David is six years older. I think, as some of you already pointed out, that you know, the, the, the size of the penis does reduce in size as you get older. So they're really the, the, the signs of the ageing process and how it affects the male body. As men age, the lack of elasticity in the skin means their scrotum and testicles hang lower. The testicles themselves also shrink in size, which makes the scrotum look emptier. Penis shrinkage is also common in older men, caused mainly by a lack of blood flow to the penis as arteries get blocked. Mother Nature can pinch up to an inch off their penis length by the time men reach their 60s or 70s. However, that needn't get in the way of healthy erections and a good sex life. They're all different shapes and sizes, they're all different ages, but they are growing older. Some are more toned than others, some are saggier than others. The important point to remember is that if you start looking after yourselves now and you're eating properly, you're exercising properly, then you can be in best possible shape as you get older. So start looking after yourselves right now. But all of these bodies are perfectly normal. So, after their first close encounter with the ageing body, do the pupils of Reigns feel less freaked out at the idea of getting old? you just got to accept your body, whatever it is, you know? got to just deal with it, I yeah. guess, because um, this is what happens when you get older. I've never seen naked old people in my life before, like, so it's just shocking, like, it's a new experience for me. We're all going to sag and like, we're all going to get slightly smaller and slightly bigger in certain places. That's true. And that we just might as well go with the flow and just take life as it comes. 
it's not just teenagers who are obsessed with what's normal, we all are. You'd think watching films or TV adverts that the only people having sex are young, thin, gorgeous straight people. But this week on The Sex Education Show, we're proving that's not the case, as I meet people we don't like to think are in any way sexual. Every night, I'm tackling a sexual taboo with the aim of squashing our squeamish attitudes towards sex. So I've met the pensioners who are putting the OMG into OAP. Are you still having good sex? Of course! See? How old are you now? 68. But I like 69 better. Last night, I found out the highs and lows of disabled sex. We have to find new ways of having sex. And tonight, I'm taking on the heavyweights. Let's face it, in this society, when you think beautiful and sexy, you think... Slim, slim, slim! But what about fat people? Don't we just think that if you're big and having sex, it's all just a bit of a joke? If she was wearing knickers that size, would you still want it? Get a bit afraid, like, wouldn't you? Yeah, 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 that's an old yeah, yeah. Yeah. Would you? No. I'd give awesome. Would you? Yes. I think the two of us could probably fit in those pants. I think so too, yeah, there you go. Do women become unattractive and See, unsexy? That's, that's where you're wrong right there. Every woman's attractive. What about if I was wearing those? Am I still sexy? It's what's on the inside that counts. So you would find a bigger woman attractive because it's just all about personality? Me, no, personally, but somebody would. Oh, OK. Somebody. OK, so you wouldn't find a fat bird attractive? So there we have it. We just don't take fat sex seriously. And for decades, we've laughed at the antics of fat people having sex. But the fact is that more and more of us are getting bigger. In a recent major study, obese men and women with partners were found to be having just as much sex as normal weight people. So I want to find out the truth about larger-than-life lovemaking. I've come to a casting today where big is definitely considered beautiful. I'm at auditions for a new plus-sized fashion magazine called Evolve. Their first issue is about sex, and they're looking for a hot new cover star. So what are you looking for today, then, Rianne? I'm looking for really confident, beautiful women who actually want to put out that, that actual vibe of being proud to be who you are. I want people who want to come out here and strut and actually show that you can be beautiful regardless of your size. OK, ready, ladies? Don't you wish you got it's obvious the girls here have no problems when it comes to feeling sexy in their skin, so it's time to ask the big question. Size 18 is 20, size 16. Are you having good sex, girls? Are you getting it? Great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the amount of sex I'm having at the moment is just unbelievable, and I wouldn't change it for the world. I would love it three, four times a day. But Seriously? sometimes you have to cope with four or five times a week. What about fitness? Because I know that when I'm having sex, I'm knackered after about a minute. No, I mean, no, how, no. how do you...? I've, I've not had any problems. I think the adrenaline rush comes to me by that point. You haven't got the palpitations, you're not sweating, nothing like that. You're just going for it. I can't say that I'm not sweating for it, but if I need to rest, then I will stop and, you know... Start again, definitely. The person who's underneath me can just, you know... Give it a little bit of a go for a few minutes. Give until... him a breather. Yeah, why not? <laughs> <laughs> and what kind of guys go for you? Gosh, it's a mixture. Um, for me, it's a kind of a guy that just stimulates my mind, makes me laugh and everything else. But it varies. You can have tall, slim, short, fat. It, it doesn't matter. I think um, the majority of guys won't admit that they would like to experience a larger lady. I think it's a lot of men's fantasies. <laughs> Is there any kind of position that really suits your size that you can make the most of? Is it like on top? I would prefer being underneath or being on all fours, really. Okay. Well, I prefer being on top. Do you? I definitely look, I like to take control slightly, so yeah. No, and I'm I... on control when I'm on the bottom, I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but also doggy's pretty good as well, because, yeah, you, you know, the way I, the men have told me they've got something to grab hold of and, you know, it's more cushion for the pushing, as they say. <laughs> So these girls are proof that you can enjoy a great sex life even if you're not built like a supermodel. Later, I hang out with some big gay bears who like their sex man size. 
If I'm with another guy that's my size, I haven't got to worry about squashing it and feeling like I'm going to kill him. And we talk tits with the teenagers at Reigns. Breasts also are a lot droopier, they become a little bit laxer and they hang down slightly. Tonight, the Sex Education Roadshow is teaching the students at Reigns Foundation School in London that the ageing process is completely normal. And by installing our question pod at the heart of the school, we've also been giving the students the chance to ask us everything they want to know about sex and their own bodies. Why do breasts sag? How often do girls get periods? How can you make an orgasm last longer? What age can you stop becoming pregnant at? Yes, girls, our bodies are going to change with age and it's all perfectly normal. So it's time to get to grips with what's in store. We are now going to have a look at the ageing female body. So girls, be prepared. Rada, what actually happens to us as we get older? So women start to visibly age from sort of 30 years onwards. What we're going to do, we're going to, again, go to our models. I'm going to go through the changes that happen. So we're going to go to Annette first. Okay, so you can see with Annette, what happens is your skin becomes a bit looser, it becomes a bit saggy, you lose that collagen, and you get these wrinkles that you see here with Annette. I'm going to pan down now, just to have a look at her breasts here. See, the breasts lose their, their sort of elasticity, the ligaments start to lack, so they begin, become a bit droopy, a bit flatter, and the nipples become a little bit smaller as well. Okay, so you can see with Muriel, you can see here again that breasts also are a lot droopier, they become a little bit laxer and they hang down slightly. So we're now going to go all the way across to Pam, who's obviously our oldest lady at 80. If we go down to, to her breasts, you can see that they also are a little bit droopier, and also the, the actual nipple area becomes a little bit smaller as well. What did you think about old ladies' bosoms? I, I thought they'll be, like, at least down to their knees, like, kind of... And you need, like, support, like, proper supportive bras and everything. We well, see, I, I'm looking at the girls and I'm thinking, that's pretty good, isn't it? You, you, your boobs looking pretty fine for your 60s and 70s. I mean, do, does that make you feel better about yourself as you get older? <laughs> yeah, kind of. That is what yours are going to end up looking like, believe you me. And actually, that's very, very good. Anybody else? Um, do you get less hair when you grow older down there? That's a very good point. Do you get less hair? OK, so let's use our models to illustrate this. Here you can see that the pubic hair is actually quite dark, isn't it? And there's, there's a fair amount of it. I'm going to sweep across now. Look at Pam now, who's obviously 80. You can see that her, her pubic hair is very, very grey, isn't it? Almost white, actually. And the amount of it is also reduced in sort of volume and, and how strong it is. It becomes a lot thinner, becomes a lot more sort of fragile and brittle. As she ages, the woman's vulva and vaginal walls become thinner, drier and less elastic. This is known as vaginal atrophy and affects up to 58% of women over the age of 50. OK, now, guys, obviously it's a bit of a shock, but what you need to understand is that actually this is a perfectly normal ageing process. We're all going to look like that sooner or later and believe me that is what's going to happen to all of us so what have the boys and girls from Reigns learned on our tour of the ageing female body I was sh very shocked when I saw it and like had like grey pubes and all that it's just crazy kind of put me off pubes for a little well ageing is something that's going to happen to everyone it's inevitable so it's better to get to grips with what's going to happen now than for it to just come on you and be like oh i've got wrinkles what do i do <laughs> they look quite in shape like that their breasts weren't as sacky as i thought they'd be every night on the sex education show i'm squaring up to our squeamish attitudes about sex and meeting people who we don't like to think of getting hot and heavy under the covers and if people who are fat and straight have a hard time being seen as sexual beings, then it's even harder if you're fat and gay. Historically, the gay scene has always worshipped the body beautiful. So, in theory, fat gay men should be on the sexual scrap heap. But that's not the case, because as I'm proving this week, when it comes to sex, there's something for everyone. I'm just about to meet a bunch of bears, and I don't mean the ones that God looks mad. I'm about to join in some bowling with self-confessed bears, Brett and Jim. OK, boys, forgive the pun, 
but just put me straight on a couple of things, OK? <laughs> I have heard that on the gay scene, in fact, I know that on the gay scene, there is a bear scene, is that right? Yes. Yeah. But given that you're wearing a bear sweatshirt, yeah. you are a bear. I am the bear. Yeah. So the, the bear is bigger, hairy... It's bigger, hairier... I've got to see yeah. it. Oh! <laughs> That is a proper... Yeah, that's a belly, isn't it? That's a, a proper, proper belly. belly. Oh, do you know who's got the biggest one? Are we talking about bears? Oh, yes. <laughs> but wherever you find a bear, you'll find a cub. OK, so what's a cub, then? We've got a belly on. Oh, yeah, you know you have, haven't you? Slim bears. So, 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 so it kind of goes in order of size, then, literally. Yeah. Now I know about the gay animal kingdom, it's time to find out about the mating habits of bears. So is bigger sex better sex for you? I mean, there's a big myth that big people don't get sex and they don't have good sex, and it's a lie. Uh, my sex life is, is fantastic. If, if I'm with another guy that's my size, I haven't got to worry about squashing and feeling like I'm going to kill him if, if, if I'm on top. Now it's before I get chance to take my top off, my top is being taken off for me. So you are now a legitimate sex object, aren't you? Yes. You're, you're a desirable Definitely. sex object. <laughs> Definitely. And what makes a cub go hunting for bears? So when it comes to sex, why do you like a bigger man? It's more to play with. What do you mean? Well, they're cuddly. I, I, I'm very, I'm very affectionate. I like to hold. I like to cuddle. I like to kiss. So yeah. there's more there. There's just more, more volume, more mass. There's just more man. Yeah, there's more man. And it's a complete myth as well that bigger guys have small penises. Well, that's... I've met, I've met more than enough, my fair share of bigger guys that have got enough big, big schlongs. Big schlongs, or a, or at least a, a good handful. Skinny guys as well. Sometimes when you go with skinny guys, and if they're definitely skinny around here, it's kind of uncomfortable when you when you, I like vigorous sex as well as the, the softer side. Yeah. But if you're going vigorous sex with a, a bear or a cub, it doesn't hurt here as much. Well, because you're not getting those. You're bones. not getting the bones. Like you'll fall away and you just ache afterwards. So you can sort of like you know really mm. chuck them about the bedroom a little bit. Yeah, it's a lot more weight in it as well, and you can get a little bit more vigorous. Whereas if they're kind of slimmy, you're kind of scared you're going to bang them for a wall. I've been bowled over by how few body hang-ups these guys seem to have. They like their men man size and they don't give a toss about six packs. Unless they're gonna drink them. But supersized sex isn't all smooth sailing. Later, I hear the shocking story of this man, whose battle with morbid obesity has wrecked his sex life. It started to get buried underneath mounds of fat. Did you have a hard on? It was still physically hard, but he just couldn't see it. He just couldn't find it. Yeah. And we spill the beans on sex and the over 60s. Muriel and Mike, you guys are still having sex, aren't you? <laughs> All this week, we're on a whistle-stop tour of the UK talking to teenagers about many aspects of our bodies and sex to show that we're all normal. Tonight, we're at Rains Foundation School in London, where we're teaching the students that the ageing process is completely natural. But when it comes to the idea of ageing and sex, the teenagers have a lot to get their heads around. Grandparents having sex is not right. Ain't they too old, like, to move about in that? I don't know how they do it, like, I, I probably yeah, don't I know. Don't get hurt. It's time for the pupils to face the fact that sex in old age is completely normal. Right, guys, it's the moment you have been waiting for because we are going to talk about sex. OK, we're talking about sex. We are talking about old people and sex. No, that's nasty. <laughs> Why is it nasty? Cos <laughs> you're 80, like, you're old, like, look at them, like, they don't work properly, like... Anybody else, what age do you think you should, you should stop? Hang on. I think you should stop at 30. <laughs> People should stop having sex at 30. So anybody else agree? Should just stop by the time you're in your 30s? No, but you've got to imagine it. Ima just imagine your parents doing it. Like, it's really... It was, it's never a pleasant thought, thinking about your parents doing it. OK, 
We've talked about what happens to you physically as you get older, but can anything happen to you when it comes to having sex when you get older? What about women? As, as we get older, girls, what actually happens to women in terms of their ability to have sex? So women obviously can still have sex, they can still have a great sex life, but because you're losing the oestrogen, you've gone through the menopause, things can be a bit drier, but you can still have sex and you can still have a great time with it. Has everybody heard about the menopause? Put your hand up if you're not too sure what it is. So not everybody does know what it is. Rada, what exactly is the menopause? So the menopause is when you stop releasing eggs, okay, which means you stop your periods and you can't have a baby naturally. The average age for the menopause in the UK is 52, and as well as vaginal dryness, other side effects include hot flushes, night sweats and mood changes. Men don't have the same best before date on their fertility and can produce sperm until the day they die. The world's oldest known dad was 92 when he fathered a child. But older men can have more of a problem getting an erection. 65% of men over 60 will suffer from erectile dysfunction at some point. Some of the main causes are smoking, high blood pressure and diabetes. Young men can also suffer from erectile dysfunction, which tends to be due to stress, anxiety or excessive use of alcohol or drugs. The thing to remember is if you keep yourself fit, you keep yourself healthy, you're more likely to have the stamina to carry on with sex. So that's the reason for you to look after your bodies now. It is really important for you all to know what happens to you physically and emotionally, really, as you get older. And the fact remains that there's absolutely no reason at all why you can't have fantastic sex going into your 60s, 70s and 80s. Just because you might sag a little bit doesn't mean that your desire is going to go and that you no longer want to have great sex with somebody that you love. Well, do you know, one thing we didn't tell you is that Two of our models are actually married. We, we've got Muriel and Mike. Can you just hold hands for us, guys? Oh. They're married. OK, Muriel and Mike, I don't know if you can hear me, but I'm really hoping you guys are still having sex, aren't you? <laughs> Mike, is it good sex? And Muriel, still enjoying yourself? <laughs> There you go. We got a thumbs up from Muriel. So that just goes to show you can be in your, you can be in your 60s and 70s, in fact, and they're still going at it and they're having a good time. So if you start looking after yourselves now, then you too can really enjoy a healthy and happy sex life as you get older. So please give them a round of applause. So what have the students at Reigns made of our full and frank discussion about sex and ageing? Most of the people that we talk to, they kind of butter things up a bit, but with this, it's like, tell you straight. I mean, that's, that's how I want to be taught. It's kind of enlightened me to say that right, anyone could have sex. It's not just for a certain age group of people, but it's weird to think about, because it's like your grandparents, in a way. Every night on the Sex Education Show, we're showing that it's normal for our bodies to come in all shapes and sizes. And we're tackling our small-minded ideas about who can have a great sex life. Tonight, I've been showing that when it comes to sex, we don't live in a one-size-fits-all world. So you are now a legitimate sex object, aren't you? Yes. You're, you're a desirable Definitely. sex object. <laughs> Definitely. One in four adults in the UK is obese, and despite all the jiggling, lots of them are still getting jiggy. But being obese can seriously harm your fertility. In women, excess fat can create a hormonal imbalance that prevents ovulation. And even if they do ovulate, obese women are up to 43% less likely to get pregnant than normal weight women. Obese men can suffer from poor sperm quality and erectile dysfunction. But I want to know if there are any other physical barriers to sex when you're obese. What if you get to the point where you're really big? Can you get to the stage where you're simply too fat to have sex? Ed Evans looks healthy enough now, having lost a huge amount of weight by taking part in a television show. But just two years ago, he tipped the scales at a whopping 34 stone. So when you're at your biggest, we're talking 34 stone, mm -hmm. when you looked at yourself in the mirror, what could you see? All I could see was just this enormous blob of fat and, and skin, and it, it, I didn't do it too often because it was just too painful. And although Ed's penis had been a normal size, his weight caused him to develop buried penis syndrome, which is where the shaft of the penis is swallowed up by the pubic fat pad that surrounds it. 
Experts have reported a significant rise in cases of buried penis syndrome in the last 10 years, caused by obesity in adults. So how, how long did you go without a girlfriend or, or without having sex, presumably? Well, from 15 up to about 28. Um, could you masturbate? I could, yeah. That, that, was, that was never a problem. Um, but that's it? That was as far as you it. could go? That was it. For all those years, over a decade? Yeah. And then I was still not even at my heaviest then and a bit of a fumbling with um, someone I met and that ended disastrously. What actually happened? Describe it to me. Working the way up to the, the big event, as it were, and then um, went to, you know, to penetrate and just have sex and, whoops, um, couldn't, basically. What do you mean? Well, m m my penis, um, it was buried, it started to get buried underneath um, mounds of fat and, and skin, so it was... Did you have a hard-on? Yeah, it, it is. Physically, it was still physically hard, but you just couldn't see it. You just couldn't find it? Yeah. And as a human being, how yeah. does that affect you? As a human being, I mean, I didn't even feel like a man for years. I, I, I didn't feel like a man after it because, you know, your, your ego, your self-esteem's just non-existent, you know, after something like that. It's how do you come to terms with not being able to perform in that way? Ed decided to tackle his obesity head on by having drastic weight loss surgery and shedding a jaw dropping 20 stone. He went under the knife again to remove the folds of excess skin and to reduce the fat pad that was still covering his penis shaft. But even after all that, he still hasn't got back his full length. Shall we stand up so yeah. I can just see how, how it kind of like stands, as it were? How it hangs? How it hangs and stands. Oh, I see. Yeah, all so, right. OK, so previously your tummy must have been right down there. It was, surely, almost, almost down to my knees, halfway down the thighs. <laughs> so you would have to lift that up? Absolutely, yeah. OK, yeah. Would, you, would you flop it onto the woman's back if you were trying to sort of, like, you know, get in behind? It did happen the once, yeah, and she didn't appreciate it. <laughs> Are you kidding? No, you no, it did. You flopped it, did, it yeah. on her back and yeah. she was like, you can get that yeah, off right exactly, now. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> yeah. OK, so your belly was hanging right down there and now you've had all your surgery, so you've got mm -hmm. your scars, but I can see that that bit there it's still quite spongy, isn't it? It is, yeah. It, it's not ideal. That's, there must be a good inch or so, at least, at the very least, it's still still buried in there. And every little helps, clearly, Absolutely. Well, I'm a bloke, you know, I, I want as big as I, as I can, but, you exactly. know... Exactly, exactly. Normal would be fine by me. Even though he hasn't got his full length back, Ed does now have more to play with, which should help him in finally getting his sex life up and running. For many people, being overweight is absolutely no barrier to having really great sex. But now that I've met Ed, I've realised that being morbidly obese can wreck your private parts as well as your sex life. At Rain's Foundation School, we've been giving the teenagers the lowdown on the ageing body to show them getting old is normal. But we also want to show the female students what's normal and what's not when it comes to a bodily function we're just too embarrassed to talk about. Let's face it, girls, we'll talk about most things when it comes to boys and our bodies, but there is one subject that is definitely a little bit taboo. Vaginal discharge. Girls have so much problems, like... Boys. Yeah, boys, 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 boys clothes, clothes, shoes... Everybody discharge never, ever comes up to, in topic. Girls, well, my girls don't really talk about discharge. I think that's quite uncomfortable to talk about because it's quite, it's very, very personal. You'll never <laughs> see it on a Facebook status, oh, yeah, sorry, yeah. discharge. It's not, it's not a stay of... Um, um, what's it called? Um, yeah. Unhappy face. <laughs> like, triple exclamation mark, unhappy face. I'm um, so sad. <laughs> You'd never see up. it. Well, the girls need to know what's normal and what's not, so I've prepared a photo gallery to show them the difference between healthy and unhealthy discharge. OK, girls. Why is it that as girls we don't talk about it? It's embarrassing. It's disgusting. It's disgusting. Yeah, it's just a bit too personal to be talking about it. I don't really want to talk about it. Vaginal discharge is incredibly important. It's part of your, of your health. Does anybody actually know what it is? Why is it there? Is it to cleanse out? the stuff in your vagina. To clean the vagina, is that right? Yeah, absolutely. So it's, it's a bit of a sort of protective measure, really. Vaginal discharge is vital in keeping a healthy balance of bacteria in the vagina, keeping it clean and lubricated. Picture number one. Ladies, feast your eyes on this. 
Rada, can you fill us in? Yeah, this is normal discharge here. It's very individual to who you are. Some women will have a little bit, others will have a lot. The key thing really is to know what's normal for you. And if there's a change in your own body, in your own amount of discharge, then that's the time to go in and see a GP or to get checked out. The amount of discharge a woman has will vary throughout her menstrual cycle, but healthy discharge is clear or white and it doesn't smell strongly or itch. OK, take a look at these two pictures. Oh, oh my days, oh my days. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that oh, bad. Yeah. Can you see the difference between yeah. normal, healthy discharge? It just looks mouldy and... Oh. <laughs> it looks mouldy. <laughs> Does it look a bit like cottage cheese? Yeah. Oh. Do, do any of you have any idea what this is? Is it fresh? Oh. Absolutely. <laughs> OK, Rada, can you mm. fill us in? Yeah, so you're right, so this is, this is thrush, which is a, a fungus, basically. It's a fungal infection. And you, do, you tend to get this kind of white, thick, itchy discharge. You'll know about it. It'll be on your pants, it'll be thick, it'll be maybe a little bit yellow. And sometimes it can cause pain when you pass urine or pain when you're having sex. So you'll definitely know about it if you get this. Thrush is extremely common. Up to 75% of women will get it at some point, and it can be caused by lots of different things, including antibiotics, perfumed soaps, wearing tight clothes and stress. It's also more common just before your period and during pregnancy. Thrush isn't an STI, but it can occur after sex because of friction, for example. Thrush can be treated with an antifungal tablet, cream or a pessary. Moving on, I've got two more pictures for you. Is this normal discharge or not normal discharge? Not normal. <laughs> Definitely not normal. What do you reckon? Rotten. It's rotten? L literally, seriously rotten. Rada, what is actually happening? So this is called bacterial vaginosis, or BV. And what happens is you get a, a grey, greeny discharge that smells really, really bad, it smells of fish. And it particularly smells even worse after sex. So you get this horrible fishy sort of smell after sex particularly. It's caused really because the pH in the vagina is slightly unbalanced. Vagina is slightly acidic, is that right? Yeah, normally it is, exactly. But it becomes slightly out of kilter and that's what causes this sort of fishy, nasty discharge. Bacterial vaginosis might look and sound scary, but it's actually the most common cause of abnormal discharge. In the UK, up to 30% of women may be affected by it. BV is not an STI, but it's more common if you're sexually active because of semen discharge, if you have chlamydia or are experiencing heavy periods. If you get a discharge like that on your pants that smells of fish, <laughs> you know it ain't right, OK? And what, what would you do about it? You go and see your GP uh, or a family planning clinic and they take a swab and then they probably just give you a course of antibiotics that will just clear it up straight away. And don't be embarrassed about going to the GP, because remember, I mean, Rada can say, you must see these things all the time. See about a five a day. <laughs> so really, your bits aren't yeah. going to look any different to anybody else's. So has our chat empowered the girls to take charge of their discharge? I am happy that now people are talking about discharge because it's seen as a taboo, but now it's not... Well, now that we've spoken about it, we know much more about it, so we won't feel ashamed or yeah. embarrassed if we have it. Now we kind of got a rough idea of, like, if things are going wrong down there, what it may color. look like, and then we've really got to do something oh. about it. For more information on normal and abnormal discharge, head to our website at www.channel4.com slash sexperienceuk. The site's packed with all the latest information and advice, including exclusive online videos about sex, our bodies and relationships. The site features people talking very frankly about their sexual experiences. So if you're under 18, parental supervision is recommended. Coming up, most teens don't talk to their parents about sex, so we arrange a surprise parents' evening with a twist. You have got the chance to speak to your mum and dad about anything you want to know about sex. <gasps> <laughs> right, come on then. What do you want to know? When did you first lose your virginity? Hmm. What age do you think I should have sex? Do you still have sex? <laughs> what? Tonight on the Sex Education Show, we've been teaching the teenagers at Rains Foundation School in London sex education like they've never had before, showing that when it comes to the ageing body, it's all perfectly natural. And our question pod has given the students a chance to ask their burning questions about sex and their bodies. What is the most common sex position? How 
how do girls get horny? What age do males start to produce their sperm? In our survey of pupils at all four schools on our roadshow, 76% said they wanted more sex education. When it comes to sex in general, who better to talk to and confide in than the very people who made you in the first place? Over two-thirds of the RAIN students said they don't discuss sex openly at home. But a recent survey for the government found that 40% of 16 to 18 year olds would have waited longer before losing their virginity if they'd had more discussions with their parents about sex. Don't talk to adults about sex because it's a bit embarrassing. If I talk to my mum about it, I'd feel like really uncomfortable, so I'd rather go to a clinic. Because it's my mum, she's old. I think people find it hard to talk to their parents about sex because it's just awkward. My mum asked me one time, have you had sex? I was like, no, mum. <laughs> and that was it. That was the conversation. Well, I want to break through the wall of silence, so I've got a surprise in store for four unsuspecting students. What is it about talking to your mum and dad about sex which is just so wrong? They just could be start bragging and saying, oh, my son or daughter tells me these sort of things. Oh, really? What, do you reckon your parents are going to start telling all their mates? Yeah. But if there was anything that you could ask your mum and dad about sex, what would you ask them? Go on, what would you do? <laughs> anything at all? Unless I wouldn't ask them a thing. Why? You wouldn't want to know about them? Yeah, but I'd just be too embarrassed to ask. The kids don't know it, but they're about to get the shock of their lives because their parents have secretly agreed to come in for a one-on-one, -on -one, no holds barred sex chat. And all I've got to do now is break the good news. But we have got a big surprise. You have got the chance to speak to your mum and dad about anything you want to know about sex. Hello? Come on in, parents. <laughs> I'm just going to leave you guys to have a little bit of family time. And with everyone here, it's time to talk sex. You're going to hate this, aren't you? Yeah. Take it away, kids. Right, come on in. What do you want to know? When did you first lose your virginity? Hmm. How old were you when you lost your virginity? <laughs> what? When and where was the first time you lost your virginity? Yeah, I don't know. I was 22. First time with your mum. Wow. Well, um, oh, um, that same age as you are now, I think. That around the 14 mark. I think 15. Where? Where and when? At home. My parents' place, yeah. Um, Come on, granddad, there. Not at the moment we did it, no. Good. How old was you when you had your first boyfriend? Um, 16. <laughs> At what age do you think I should have my first boyfriend? 25. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> now they've taken the plunge, the kids decide to delve a bit deeper. Do you still have sex? <laughs> when you and your sister keep out of the way, yes. <laughs> OK. Yeah. Does love change? It doesn't really change, I suppose, as a 40-year-old or a 30-year-old. You don't know if you think differently than a 16-year-old. Is sex important the older you get? For me, it's not about sex, it's about to have somebody next to you. Do you think sex is good in a relationship? If it's part of a solid relationship. What age do you think I should have sex? Never. <laughs> <laughs> How long did you wait until you had sex? Ah, what, were you mother? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> not very long. <laughs> And finally, it's a chance for the parents to pass on their pearls of sexual wisdom. Find the right person, uh, someone you feel comfortable with. It's going to be OK, that's what I reckon. Big advice is, at this day and age, use a condom. What advice would you give me? I'd say you're only 16. Concentrate on your education. If you are going to have a relationship, find somebody what's going to treat you with respect. You know, you can always ask whatever questions you want. Any answers that you need, we don't have to sit here and, and do this. You can do it at any time. OK. 
I think I'll be more willing to talk to my mum about this kind of stuff now than I was before, but I don't know if I'd actually do it still. Yeah, I was quite shocked at my dad losing his Virginia at 22, but definitely take my dad's advice on choosing the right person. But yeah. Yeah, it was interesting. I guess I could talk to him more openly now. So it has been beneficial. It's horrible, but beneficial. So the sex education lessons at Rains Foundation School have come to an end. We've opened the students' eyes to the fact that the ageing process is totally normal and that it's no barrier to a happy and fulfilling sex life. I'm glad I did it because it, it was an experience and um, yeah, it, it's, it's, a, it's a fun way to learn, it's very interactive. It's such a taboo sub subject to talk about, this was like sort of in your face, it was like, this is what's going to happen, so you just sort of learn from it, it's really good. Mission accomplished. If you want more information about any aspect of tonight's show, including what's normal when it comes to sex and our bodies, then visit our website at www.channel4.com slash sexperienceuk. But remember, the site features people talking very frankly about their sexual experiences, so if you're under 18, parental supervision is recommended. Join me tomorrow when the Sex Education Roadshow hits Peterborough to teach the students of Bourne Grammar School the highs and lows of making babies. You can see an eye, little nose, cheek there. <laughs> oh, that is disgusting. Oh my god, this isn't going well. And I meet a couple with learning disabilities who are banging for Britain. Do you still enjoy having sex with oh, each other? Yes. Yes, of course we do. <laughs> no. It's, it's romantic. Forever, aren't we? Yeah. So to learn from other viewers' first-hand experience of sexual issues, problems and solutions, go to channel4.com slash sexperienceuk. And you can rejoin the Sex Education Show tomorrow evening back at 9 o'clock. And then at 10, a question for the parents. What would you do if your children are underage and having sex?